The, the thing that counts is always that when you read scripture you've got to take it in context and not make a pretext of it and one of the traps that's happened is that many Christians read their Bibles as though somehow it's a text book which will explain everything uh, in a way that will uh, give you doctrine from correction. For instance, Paul's explaining to the Corinthian church, there's sin named amongst you that's not named amongst the Gentiles. And then he brings correction to the extremes of sin. That is not the doctrine of a Christian life. Christians shouldn't live that way. What he's saying is, hey, you need to learn to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You need to live right. But the way of correction wasn't the way of justifying a sinful life with an old nature. It was merely saying to people, you're wrong, get right. Same in the Corinthian church, same in the Colossian church, same in the Ephesian church. Always, when the epistles are written, they were written for correction. You can't take Paul's 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 on the gifts of the Spirit and say that's the model for the church of using the gifts. No, he was correcting excesses. And he was saying that's excessive. You're all coming together, you're all speaking it in tongues at once. That's ridiculous. It wasn't against the gift of tongues, he was against the excesses. So he was bringing correction. But correction doesn't bring a model of what it's to be. So if you're that which I would not, that I do in Romans 7, it's because Paul's correcting error. People who are living under the law. How the law have a dominion over a man as long as he liveth. But you're dead, you've been buried with Christ in baptism in Romans 6. And there is no condemnation in Romans 8. For they that walk in the spirit and in the spirit of life and the law of the spirit of life, are set free from the law of sin and death. Is that plain? Let us go to Scripture. I want to talk about it. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. And you'll find in verse 1, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him, I showed before him my trouble when my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walk have they privily laid a snare for me and so on. Now look, what's wrong with this psalm if you're a Christian? I'll tell you what's wrong with the psalm. It doesn't apply to you. Why? Because it's old covenant. You've got better promises, better hope, better life, Christ in you. It's poetry, and it was sung by the Jew Jews, and it was sung in their nation, but it's not a Christian psalm. It, it's a Hebrew psalm, and it's for the Old Testament and Old Covenant. Is that plain? So if you're one of these people that loves to console yourself in the Old Testament it's because you haven't got born again yet. Get born again into the New Covenant and you'll find that those things are miserable. In fact he comes to the end of the psalm and here's his prayer. He says bring my soul out of prison and, and actually the word there can be spirit out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Hey, if you're in prison, there's one thing for sure, you're not born, are you? Now, when you look at the Galatian uh, epistle, uh, let's go back there. You remember we were in Galatians. When you look at it, um, you've got to understand to whom it was written and for what purpose. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 1 of Galatians, what does it say? I marvel what? So soon remove from what? Him that called you. Where to? Unto another gospel, which is not another, 
but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, the whole of this epistle starts by making it plain these people have gone wrong. In other words, it's trying to correct a fault. It is not in any way extolling the virtue of a Christian church. It's extolling the virtues of getting right with God. You've, you've got perverted. You've gone from the true gospel unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there be some that are going to pervert the truth. And what has happened is Christians have taken the fault to justify wrong living in defeat. And so they've said, oh, well, look at the Galatian church. It says in Galatians this. It says in Corinthians this. Now, what they've done, they've gone under law. They'd gone away from the grace of God and they were trying to justify themselves by the law. Now this is what Paul faced. They were going back to the old Judaic ways and the rituals of the Jews and the Pharisees and they were saying, look, if you want to be a Christian, you can have Christ, but you must keep the law. And you remember that the whole of um, the 400 silent years, the Levites had opened up synagogues and taught rituals and taught the precepts of man for the law of God and they were all bound up with all sorts of funny ideas and they'd gone way away from Christ and when Jesus Christ returned to earth his main thing was to bring back and establish the law and fulfill the law what he said to people is hey you've changed the law of God into the precepts of man you've got all kinds of ideas of what life should be and you're teaching that, but that's not the law of God. That's not what God said. And so Jesus was coming and re-establishing the law. Jesus never taught the new covenant. He never lived in the new covenant. He couldn't. Because the new covenant wasn't established till his blood was shed on Calvary. And he ascended into heaven. And when he presented to the Father the blood and became our high priest and our advocate, then the new covenant was birthed on the day of Pentecost. So everything that Jesus taught, you've got to look at in relation. There were prophetic words that were spoken about the new covenant coming, but he didn't teach new covenant principle. Paul does. John does. But that's when the new covenant has come in. What Jesus was saying is, hey, You've perverted the word of God. You've changed the law of God. You've made it into the precepts of man. And I find a lot of Christians get their errors out of the gospel. They go to the gospels and they live in old covenant teaching rather than new covenant reality. And it's because no one's told them where the new covenant began. And they don't understand that Jesus, that's why he could say to his disciples, hey, you know, when I'm gone, greater works than these shall you do. Well, there's going to be a greater work. Why is there a greater work? Because you're going to have a new covenant where people will come into life, new life, new hope, where miracles will be normal. That is the new church. It wasn't established in his day. The disciples only moved under his authority. They could heal the sick under his authority. They could cast out devils under his authority. But Calvary and the total defeat of every demon, every principality, every power, did not happen until Calvary. Is that plain? Hello? Is that plain? And when you understand that, and you begin to put things into perspective, you understand that there's no blueprint for the church. The whole of Paul's writings, when he wrote to a church, he wanted to establish in, in Christian truth, but he also wanted to correct the error. Don't take the error as being a normal way of Christian living. It's not. Take the objective truth that's true and believe that and realize that is what you should live in. What God says you live in. What you don't live in is the error. Okay? No. 
Are you understanding that? Now, that might really affect some of your brains, or it might not even <coughs> occur to you. When he spoke, let's take um, the prophetic words of um, Ezekiel. Go back with me to Ezekiel 11. Uh, verse 17, speaking of the new covenant that was going to come, he says in verse 17, Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel, and they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence, and I will Give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now God was saying, it's new heart, that's a new spirit, and, and the word is interchangeable, a new heart, a new spirit. I'm going to put inside my people so they can walk in truth. God said, I've got to take away the stony heart. The stony heart spoke of the Mosaic law, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. You'll find it over in Ezekiel 36, verse um, 26. Let's go there. He goes and he elaborates on it. In Ezekiel 36, well, let's say verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and bring you unto your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land of your fathers that I gave unto your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. God was prophesying through Ezekiel. He was saying, look, there's coming a day when I'm going to gather you. And he said, when I do, I'm going to have to do something inside of you. I take out the stony heart. I give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you. I'm going to live within you. You can't live a Christian life unless there's a total transformation. It's called new birth. You must be born again. You must be born of water and the spirit. God is going to work inside you to do something. Take out the old, put in the new. A new heart will I give you. That doesn't mean the old heart remains. He says, no, I'm taking out the stony heart. Is that plain? Is that plain? Yes. In other words, there's not going to be a stony heart and a new heart working together. They're not. God's taking away legalism. God's going to bring in life. God's taking out the old mosaic and the legalism and God is putting within you his spirit so you can live in freedom and life. Don't ever get the idea that you've got two natures inside you. When the stony heart goes, the old nature goes. That's why it says, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. Old things are passed away, all things become new. That's why you must be born again of water and the Spirit. And when you're born, you receive a new nature, the nature of God. God said, I will put my Spirit within you. I'll take out your stony heart. I'm going to remove it from you forever. There is no sense in which a Christian should be living with a dualistic nature. Is that plain? Now many theologians, because 
they're theologians and don't understand and study only the scriptures, they base all their theology on what they read and their own personal experience. And therefore they'll come along and they'll say, well, of course, we all have struggles. Well, you speak for yourself. Don't speak for me. And don't speak, you'll have a struggle if that's what you believe. I don't believe in it. I believe in freedom in Jesus Christ. I've got a new spirit. God said he would cause me to walk. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. Let's go uh, and look on John 13. John 13. Verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are di my disciples, if you have love one to another. How are people going to know you're a disciple? By love, one to another. Do you know the hardest thing for anyone to do is to love someone else? Most people love themselves too much to love anyone else. And if, if they manage and they scrape through to love someone else, it's only for their own benefit. And they call it marriage. You need someone to wash your shirts, do your ironing, um, do your cooking. Man is innately selfish. That's what came with the fall. We live for ourselves. It's only when you're born again you can begin to live and love another in the way God intends. That's why it takes the Holy Ghost shed abroad in our hearts to love. If the Holy Ghost doesn't get inside and the love of God's not shed abroad in your heart, you've just got human love which is very, very puny and it depends if circumstances go right, you'll love people as long as they do what you want. Apart from that, there's no love. But Jesus said, in my church, you're going to have a new heart, a new spirit, a new attitude, and that love will flow from inside, so it will be a love of laying down your life. Now, Peter boasted he was already ready for it. Look, you read on. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Truly, truly, I say unto you, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me Peter, you didn't know the, the new covenant's not open yet. Peter, you don't know you've still got a stony heart. You don't know what's in you, Peter, yet. You think you can lay down your life. Peter, you're so wrong. But there came a day called the day of Pentecost when Peter became a witness to that life and that power and he had a new spirit and a new heart and he came out totally different in nature. Not that he lived in fear, he didn't. They were continually in the temple praising God. They were never locked up in fear because they had seen the risen Lord. But there came a day when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and the whole of their lives changed. But at that point, Peter didn't know he needed a nature change. And that's how a lot of Christians are, so-called Christians. They've come to the legalistic acknowledgement of truth, but they've never had a fundamental new birth that has transformed their insides, and they've got filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to live in the victory that Jesus purchased on Calvary's tree. God expects us to live in victory. God expects us to live in the power of his spirit. So you can say with Paul, I live, nevertheless not I, 
but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Why he lives in me. Is that plain? Hello? Okay, let's go on. It's good we've got the Bible. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. Verse 16 says, For this cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You've got an inward man and an outward man. And your inward man you'll find right through Scripture, and I'm coming to it in Ephesians, but right through Scripture your inward man is what counts. Your spirit inside. Your spirits become one spirit with God's spirit. Now you've got the outward man, which is your flesh, and you've got all your, your senses there. You've got your taste, your smell, your sight, your hearing, your speaking, uh, and all the sensory things you've got on your outward man, but you've got an inward man. God has given you a new spirit and a new heart. You've got an inward man, and Christ lives in you. Now your outward man is getting older. Uh, you can eat well, live well, exercise well, but no matter what you do, you're going to get older, aren't you? Huh? It's one of the unavoidable things in life, age. Every day you're getting older. But your inward man is renewed day by day. You don't get old in your inward man, you get younger. Because daily it's renewed. Daily. That's why Jesus said, you know, if you're coming to the kingdom of God, you've got to come as a little child. Why? There's a renewing inside. You can be very young inside while you look old on the outside. If you find someone's getting old on the inside, they've left Christ. There's a youthfulness inside. There's life inside. It's renewed day by day. And that's your inward man. You say, well, shouldn't you care about others? Yes. But you care about others by showing forth the life and joy of Christ and bringing them to victory by preaching the gospel. You see, the only thing that divides between soul and spirit is the word of God. God called us to preach. How shall they hear without a preacher? Faith cometh by, not by praying. God get the Christian church back into balance. Pray always. What does prayer mean? Fellowship with the Father. In relationship with my Father. Jesus said, what I hear that I speak. What I see the Father do, that's what I do. Fellowship with the... That's true prayer. Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians. Talking about the inward man, okay? And we'll stick in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Says this in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he bound to? Father. I'm going to bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What for? Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Here you are, we're in the family. And the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And then he goes on. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit, where? In the inner man. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, and length and depth and height unto know the love of Christ which passes knowledge 
that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I like that. This is an old nature, new nature, is it? Hello? This isn't struggle, is it? This is your new... You say, well, why did he play that to the Ephesians? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the Ephesians got slightly off-center. So he's correcting them and saying, hey, you've got to understand, you've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. In chapter 1, he says, in heavenly places in Christ, and that wasn't positional. He's already said you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's wanting to get you to know where you are and what you are in Christ. What you should be. You need to be strengthened with all might in the inner man. You need the love of God shed abroad in your heart. God by his spirit wants to quicken and enliven you. This is what you need. This is the normal Christian life. Not failure. Why? That Christ might dwell in your hearts. That's what it's about. Your inner man has Christ within. In Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wonderful. But you find in Ephesians, it goes, you can't just stop there. Go back to um, Ephesians 1. Look at this, in verse 6 of Ephesians 1. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Look, you're part of the family. You're in the beloved. You belong. <laughs> you're not in, in a twilight zone where you've got an old nature and a new nature and a battle. You're in. You're part of the family. You belong. And you're in the beloved. And then he goes on in verse 7. Look what he says. In whom? Where? It's in Christ. Christ is in you. And in him, you've got redemption. It's all in him. You're in him. And the whole emphasis is what you're in. It is not a suggestion that you're trying to become holy. You're trying to get in. No! You are in. Now you need strengthening in your inner man. You need to know what is the hope of his calling. You need to know what God has done for you. That's what Paul's writing about. It excites me. Don't know, you lot seem dead, but for me, whoa. You see, and people say, oh, but this is positional. No, this is real. This is a real reality. You're either in or you're out. I'm alive. He lives in me. Strengthened in the inner man. There's something flowing in my veins and body. Hey! I'm alive in God. The devil's in trouble. I'm not fighting inside. God made peace. He delivered me. He took me out of the prison house. He released my soul. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. You sung it. You didn't believe it. Let's read on. Oh, it's good you've got a Bible. Uh, you know, it, it said between 9 and 11 times, it's in, in, in. He wants to get it over to you. In... Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, look at this. Verse 4. Oh, let's take... No, we can't do that. Look. Uh, let's take verse 1 of chapter 2. And, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You were. You're not dead any longer. That's what you were, that's past. We're in, in time past. It's not a present thing, it's a time past. And if it isn't past for you, get born again, get saved. We're in, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, but you are not one of them. You're in the family of God. He explains it. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature. Oh, there's the nature. We were. That's something we were. We're not any longer. Were. By nature, the children of wrath, even as others. But God. What a wonderful but, isn't it? You know, you were that. No one's denying that. You were a sinner by nature. You were alien from God by nature. But that was past, not present. Don't ever let people tell you, oh, well, you know, you've got two natures. That's the devil talking, not God talking. Don't ever let that be in your mind. You need that devil cast out of you. It's wrong. You're alive. Christ in you. Light and darkness can in no wise dwell together. I believe it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look, look at this, look at this. Let's go on. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, see, that's what you were, not what you are, hath quickened us together with Christ. You're quickened together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together. You're not separated from God, you're together with God, Christ lives in you, you've been raised up. Why don't you believe what God says about you? Say, oh well, that's positional. Well, get in the right position then. Live it. We're raised up together in heavenly places. That, what, in the ages to come he may show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Hey, what kindness is it to leave you with a struggle in your life for the rest of your days? No kindness at all. What kindness is it or what salvation is it to leave you with two natures battling away so you're tormented on one side, victorious on the other side, and you, you know, all the day long you conflict, you struggle, you fight, and you're trying to save yourself. Well, that's not love. Love is when glory to God is my savior. My, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm washed. I'm clean. I'm free. Glory to God. And if you're not that, you're not a Christian. Born from above. Christ in you. Part of the family of God. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? Let's go on. Look at them. Uh, where am I? I've lost myself. Uh, I will go. So, oh, verse 10 of chapter 2. Look at that. For, what are we? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. Look. Do you think that God's workmanship is so bad that he's going to leave you with a mess? Ah, well, you see, God's working on you. No, we are his workmanship. What are we created in Christ Jesus for? Good works that God has foreordained that we should walk in them. It's done. It's done. I, I got a new nature. I was trying to find escape from life. 
I was trying to find fulfillment. I was trying to find something to answer a crying need inside. I was a sinner. And there was nothing I could do that would satisfy something inside. And then there came a day when I got born from above and God delivered me and I came alive in God. And that drive of sin and the man of sin was outside because God took the stony heart out of my flesh, gave me a heart of flesh and put his spirit inside. And my, I had peace for the first time in my life. And that is what Paul talks about. And that's what every Christian who's born again talks about and knows. Romans chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so also we also should walk what in? newness of life we've been raised with him for if we've been planted in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this what are you knowing that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might slowly be got rid of. What? It's destroyed. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The devil made us sinners. We were born and conceived in sin. Yeah, we lived that way. That was in time past. But God who's rich in mercy bored us out. Amen? We're alive in God. Buried. Baptism. Why? That he might destroy the old man of sin. Wanted to destroy it. That's what he came to do. Why? That, verse 6, that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It says this. It says this in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If you then being risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above not on things of the earth. For you are and your life is hid with Christ in God. Okay. Verse, um, verse 9. Lie not one to another. Lying is a terror. I can't stand liars. Tell you why. He said, don't lie one to another. There's something wrong. You, what can you do if a person lies? You never know when you can believe anything they say. And I'd say of some people that are liars, even when they tell the truth, I don't believe it. Because it has a spin. It says, lie, not one to another. Seeing what? Seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. You put it off. When did you put it off? Now, he's talking to the Colossian church, and the Colossian church got themselves in a mess. And he's saying, come on, I want to straighten this out. You're dead. You're alive in Christ. Christ lives in you. But you've got yourselves living wrong. He said, put to death your members. It doesn't mean because you're a Christian that you can't sin. 
You've still got your natural desires. You can still walk out of light. You can still rebel against God. But he's saying you shouldn't. Put off the old. Put on the new. In other words, he was dealing with a church where it was and he was bringing correction. What he wasn't doing was saying it's a normal state. Put off the old. Verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We're renewed in knowledge and we're renewed in the spirit of our minds. Why we live in victory. I'm a great believer in the victory that's in Christ. Romans 12, Romans 12, now, um, ah, Romans 12, I was just about to read from the wrong book, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy, holy, acceptable to God which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect what? Will of God. That's what we're going to prove, the will of God. Do you know, what God has done if you're born again is given you the freedom to live. Put off the old, put on the new. Walk in newness of life. The only reason you walk in death is because you've been taught wrong and believed wrong. Strongholds of Satan are in the mind. If you believe the wrong thing, you'll live it. If you believe the truth, you'll live it. And it's all to do with what you believe. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you believe what I've said, you can live it. The only reason people live in defeat is because they believe the lie. Then they put on their old man and they say, Oh, well, you've got to understand there's the old man and there's this. And No, you put off the old man. You did that when you got born again. God took the stony heart out of your flesh. He gave you his spirit. Christ lives in you. You're in the family of God. You're seated in heavenly places in Christ. You have put off the old. You have put on the new. Walk in newness of life. What a wonderful thing. Is that plain? You know, there's only one song you could sing to this. And that's the song, He's my advocate, isn't he? He's my great high priest. He's everything. It's so easy. If you believe what I say that the book says, and you'll bring your life into believing the book, you can put off the old and put on the new and walk in newness of life, and hey, you can walk in freedom. You haven't got to somehow struggle for it. God did it when you got born. If so be, you're born again. It's time to live in victory. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall... That's what truth does, it sets you free.